Welcome to Voice Bootcamp, a global name in unified communication. Hello, my name is Faisal Khan, CEO and founder of Voice Bootcamp. In this soft study kit of deploying Cisco Unified Contact Center Enterprise with CVP 11.5, we're going to discuss about the design consideration. So we're going to look at some of the general uh, solution requirement, followed by uh, information about ingress, egress, and VXML gateways. We'll look into the central controller, uh, sorry, contact center enterprise design consideration, followed by call manager design consideration. Now, just like any network uh, design that you do, one of the two most important thing is obviously is always back up your config if there is anything needs to back up, and of course, date and time. Uh, run a data uh, backup tools should you need to backup previous config or existing configuration or router config, whatever the information that you're going to touch or devices that you're going to touch. Uh, if there is any existing configuration on there, please have a scheduled maintenance window set up so that you can back that up uh, as needed basis. If you are going to use Microsoft SQL Server locally, for example, uh, meaning that uh, you are storing the data into the local server, then make sure that uh, the local machine has the necessary sufficient capacity. NTP and time synchronization is extremely important uh, for contact center because it requires that all parts of solution have the same time for logging purposes as well as for timestamp. When time drift occurs naturally, it is critical to configure an NTP uh, to keep solution components synchronized. Now, to prevent time from default drift in a live data report, NTP settings on the virtual machine must be synchronized to ensure that the log router, logger, admin data, and CYC reporting server should be synchronized to the same timing. So these are some general uh, solution requirements that you may need to keep in consideration. Now, most likely you will already have this part of your existing infrastructure. Now, as far as the design is concerned, uh, we're going to take a look at quick snapshot of 2000, 4000 and 12000 design uh, topology. So to design a detailed, 2000, sorry, detailed design of 2000 agents, this is what, a, what an environment looks like. So uh, starting from left to right, so we're going to focus on site A data center. You will usually have a voice XML gateway for processing VXML uh, applications, for rendering via VXML application. You will have your egress uh, or ingress uh, voice gateway for receiving and sending calls from PSTN. Now that does not necessarily mean it has to be T1, it could be SIP trunk as well. Now you could have ha uh, you could connect that call coming through SIP, Cisco, uh, SIP proxy server right here. And then from there, the call will go to CVP. So you will have a CVP server. Uh, CVP server will have, may have a SIP proxy, uh, SIP connection directly to your call manager subscriber, right? For example, which in return will have a connection to your ICM, uh, sorry, agent PG. So usually uh, you, will, you will have a raw, uh, UCC component, for example, Rogger, you will have a PG server, you will have an admin server for day-to-day -day administration, you will have CVP server, operation console, and reporting server. So typically you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, roughly around seven servers on the left-hand side, for example, on site eight. Uh, sorry, so eight, eight, eight server, actually, Finus is also nine. Now that is up to 10 servers you have on the uh, site A data uh, network. On the site B data center, you will also have exactly very much similar network. Uh, the only difference might be is that you may have a different uh, uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, subscriber's address because of the single CTI manager. But again, yeah, for redundancy, you're gonna make sure you have a voice XML gateways, ingress gateways, CVP, reporting the only thing that's not there on the side b is this server right here because uh, a single operation manager a cvp can only be managed by a single uh, operation operation console manager so therefore you only need one all right so that's pretty much the type of number of servers virtual machines that rather you need for up to 2000 uh, reference design
Now let's take a look at what we need for 4,000. Almost very similar, except that what, we, what we're doing here is that we're, we're increasing the number of PG, where ISO uh, and the number of HDS, uh, AWD uh, server. Also, we are uh, where in the previous design, these were all under the same virtual machine. Now they are in independent virtual machines. So the idea behind that is that in order to support 4,000 agent, the quantity of servers will increase. But the key, the reason why it is increasing is because you are isolating or rather uh, dedicating particular virtual machine for a particular services, uh, as opposed to co-resident with multiple different applications. Now you repeat that with side B, so almost pretty much. So therefore you have exact duplicate servers on side on the B side as well. Now that is for 4,000 design. Now imagine what a 12,000 design will look like. I'm not going to even bother counting it. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on. Now, as far as the uh, ingress, egress, and VXML gateway, UCCE will use iOS gateway for TDM ingress and VXML rendering. Any Cisco voice gateway uh, that that uh, e solution support can either be a ingress gateway, egress gateway, or VXML, or all of them at the same time. You could also use Cisco Virtualize Voice Browser as an alternative to Voice Gateway. Voice, uh, uh, vo sorry, Virtualize Voice Browser is basically a, a, via a virtual machine that pretty much does the same uh, functionality as a Voice XML Gateway to a certain degree. Uh, for example, you can create application uh, in the Voice uh, Virtualize bro uh, Browser. You can play the media files off the flash, or which is kind of like a from the server itself, as opposed to having a Cisco uh, iOS based router. So that would be one advantage of uh, using the uh, VB, VVSP, for example. Now, PSTN and voice gateways. So as you can see that this is where your ingress and egress gateway relies on your topology. Usually packet will come in from your PSTN network traffic will to, to this gateway, which will be acting as ingress. From there, of course, a call can go to your call manager PBX or SIP proxy server. So PSTN is responsible for delivering the call inbound to your voice gateway. Uh, typically in the inbound call, you include a DNIS information, that is a dial number. And the purpose of the dial number, of course, well, the importance of the dial number is that the dial number it kind of gives you an intention as to, uh, well, it gives you the uh, the intent of the call. If you're dialing a support number, for example, obviously your intention is to call support line. If you're calling the help desk, uh, sorry, uh, sales desk, your intention is to call the sales. The UCC already knows uh, the intent of the caller. Now. The dial number, of course, can be in variable length, depending, sometimes could be four digit, could be 11 digit number from the service provider. Now, if our internal dial numbers are four digit, it is up to us to convert that into four digit and then have the call route to the necessary peripheral gateway. So voice gateway uh, or in call manager, sometimes you need to modify those dial number from 11 to four digit uh, conversions. So. Uh, a typical call flow from service provider to your call manager, for example, will come from, for example, a call will come in from the user via the PSTN to your router, inbound router. Now that's step one. Step two will be either send the calls directly to call manager, either using H323, MGCP or SIP. So these are the three choice of protocols we have between a voice gateway and a call manager. Or you, we can send a call to SIP proxy server using SIP protocol. And then SIP proxy server will ultimately send the calls to call manager. And of course, SIP proxy server has to be configured according to that. And then last option is to send the calls directly through the gatekeeper to the call manager as well. Now, obviously in this scenario, what the gatekeeper does, gatekeeper will ultimately tell the voice gateway to contact call manager directly. So these are your choice. Ultimately, the call manager, whichever direction the call comes in, will ring the phone and advertise the extension IP address of the phone to the gateway. And the gateway will then initiate a call, establish an RTP session right through this between 
the gateway and the phone itself. That's the RTP sessions. Next, we'll look at uh, enterprise design consideration. In this, we're going to uh, look at the router design. Now, again, the router, which is the main engine of UCCE, it executes the routing script along with admin script. Your routers, router A and router B, could be distributed geographically into different buildings, different data center, different city, different countries. It is always a good idea to isolate them so that if in case one side goes down, the other side is not affected because of the environmental or physical restrictions. So it is always a good idea to put site B into either a different backup data center, a disaster site, or different building, different city, for example. In production environment, the router logger and AWHDS DDS must connect over a private network. So what, what is important part here is because you are deploying this in both A and B, it is extremely important that you have a private network between them, either directly same network or LAN local area network across the WAN, it doesn't matter. Heck, the IP address doesn't even have to be public or uh, private. It could be a public IP address, but as long as it's designated for the private network. What uh, the, uh, these components use the private network for is to carry the heartbeat and replication information. You can use the same private network for central controller along with the PGs as well. But the private controller should not carry, so a private network should not carry any other non-UCCE related traffic, such as internet, database, stuff like that. Logger design is exactly the same as the router design, should be deployed in a redundant fashion between multiple geographical locations, including must have a private network. Logger will communicate with router over the private network. Logger usually does not point to the opposite uh, other side using the public network. Now, the logger sometimes um, keeps up to, uh, what do you call um, call detail records for up to two weeks usually. Uh, this period allows enough time for data to be replicated for AW HDS server. Logger can be uh, uh, use the same private network path as the router is. Now peripheral gateway. So here's my peripheral gateway. PGA, PGB. PGA points to CTI manager and subscriber A and subscriber B. So it is extremely important that each individual PG that is pointing to the UCM cluster must, uh, uh, for each server rather, each server in your call manager cluster must point to one in specific PG. So in this case, although I have four subscribers, um, the PGA and PGB are actually pointing to only uh, these two. Uh, sub sub a and sub b so if i want to point to sub c or sub d i could either use a multiple pim or i could use a separate pg server whenever you are connecting to a call manager cluster where your agent phones are whichever pg connects to that cluster is known as agent pg now agent pg can control the agent phone and ctr rod point anywhere in the cluster even though they are registered to subscriber A. Agent PG register with CTI manager on a particular subscriber or even publisher for that matter. CTI manager will accept all the JTAPI communication from the PG and use that communication to control whatever that it needs to control. When PG requests a phone or CTI route point on another subscriber, the CTI manager will forward the request to that subscriber itself. Agent PG is the PG that includes a call manager PIM known as Unified PG. In non-reference design, the agent PG might be generic PG where a generic PG can be shared between a call man as PVX as well as VRE type. PG will only connect to one particular CTI manager. So therefore, if that CTI manager fails, the PG cannot communicate with the call manager cluster. A redundant PG will provide a secondary path toward a second subscriber CTI manager. So again, PGA points to, uh, oops, uh, PGA points to subscriber A, PGB will point to subscriber B. 
A minimum design for high availability cluster is that one publisher and two subscribers should be uh, in your environment. If the primary subscriber fails, the device will rehome to secondary subscriber, not to the publisher, as a, as a recommended design. Now, redundant PG, the second PG that you have, uh, keep in synchronization through the private network that is isolated from the public. Age, uh, within the agent PG, the JTAPI gateway and call unified CM PIM, Peripheral Interface Manager, will manage the connectivity to the cluster. Uh, when I say cluster, I'm talking about call manager or CUCM cluster. JTAPI gateway will handle the JTAPI socket connection protocol and the messaging between the PIM and the CTM manager. The PIM, on the other hand, manages the interface between the UCCE and JTAP gateway and the cluster itself. PG will start the JTAP gateway and PIM automatically in a node managed process. Uh, PG also monitors the process and automatically restart if it fails. The JTAP service on both redundant agent PG will sign into the CTI manager and call manager after initialization. Now, of course, uh, agent PGA will sign in to CTI manager. Agent PGB will sign into secondary CTI manager. However, only one, P one PG in the pair will be active at any given time. Monitors the phone and CTI route point. But the redundant PG server will sign in to the secondary CTI manager, but it will only for initialization into purposes. It will not actually take any role at that moment. When the system will start, the PG that first connect to the rod, router server request the configuration information is the active PG. So what do you want to do? If you want to make if you want to make sure that the PGA always become an active, then make sure PGB is down. Turn on the PGA or restart the service on PGA. Give it a few seconds and then bring PGB up and running. Now the router, which ensures that the PG with the best connection becomes active. The nominal designation, of course, site A and site B does not affect the PG's role. So just because site PGA, PGA is on PG, uh, you know, is the is primary A, does not mean that it's going to be the active site, uh, active PG. So it is possible that PGB is the active because the router decide which PG becomes active based on the best connection. and whoever is communicated with the router first. Now, during the PG failover caused by either private link failure or uh, weight mechanism choose, uh, choose well, during the PG, PG failover by the private link failure, so if there's private link fail right here, a waiting, a waiting mechanism chooses which PG is active to minimize the impact on the contact center. Now remember, if the private goes down, it does not mean that PGA is down or it does not mean PGB is down. A weighted uh, mechanism uh, will be used to choose which PG will be uh, used to serve the call. If a call arrives to a CTR rod point before the PIM or peripheral interface manager is operational, the call will fail until you set up a recovery number. You cannot, however, use the directory number that you assign to CTI rod point to a different CTR rod point on another partition. You must ensure that the DNs are unique across all CTR rod point. Active PG shuts down. Uh, sometime in the active PG will shut down in order to avoid an active peripheral gateways. You know, configuration issue can uh, cause an active PG to go down, or if the IP address is not pingable, active PG can go down. So. Uh, it is possible that you may need to um, use a command call stop shut. Whenever you see an active PG shutting down or going down, it will give you an error message saying system is rebooting. Uh, you just immediately go to command prompt and type a command call stop shut. Admin server role, uh, each real-time distributor can, up to, can support up to 64 users. So this is a recommendation of how many uh, servers you need before 2000, 4000, 12000 agent. You need one per site for AWDS. For 4000, you need two per site. 
and for 12,000 not applicable because you got to split them into separate servers. HDS and DDS not required for 2,000, 4,000, but one per uh, 12,000 uh, 12, agent. AW HDS optionally either for uh, AW HDS or AW HDS DDS. So here you can see that AW HDS HDS dash DDS is not applicable for 2000 or 4000 because in 2000 or 4000 you can actually play this role because their deployment size is small. So therefore, they will, that option will not be available for uh, two uh, for um, let's say twelve thousand agent. AWHDS, on the other hand, you must have at least one on either side, uh, three for twelve thousand. Real time distributor, two per site for all the design. Live data server, which is basically uh, part of CYC reporting, where any event between the PG and a router will be captured and sent to the uh, live data reporting server, which could be co-resident with uh, Unified Intelligence Center, which is your reporting server, or it can be a dedicated box. It is designed to co-resident with 2000 agent. You can typically use large light live data deployment configuration for separate router and a logger. For call manager, which act as a PBX in environment in UCC environment, call manager cluster is basically a logical relationship of multiple virtual machines nowadays. Call manager will connect uh, calls passed from CVP or voice gateway to the agent that is chosen by the UCCE, though that agent might be associated directly registered to the same call manager. CVP will transfer the call to UCCE agent phone or desktop via SIP protocol. So there, there must be a SIP uh, trunk between the call manager and the CVP server. Unified CVP call server will pass an uh, agent label, which happens to be an extension of the phone from the UCCE and route the call using SIP proxy server. All contact centers enterprise solution will use a redundant call manager, redundant UCCE, redundant CVP port component. Now, to enable automatic failover, recovery or pair of redundant component interconnect over private network. So again, uh, you got to make sure that there is a heartbeat going on between the servers, uh, such as right here. Call manager will use cluster design for failover. Each cluster will contain publisher and multiple subscribers. Agent phone and computer will register the primary target. If it fails, it will register to your secondary target, such as subscriber, another subscriber. To uh, design UCC, uh, agent, P, uh, sorry, um, PG for CUCM, it is recommended that you deploy an agent PG for each pair of subscribers. Each subscriber that runs his own CTI manager service, each agent PG will connect to a particular CTI manager running on a corresponding pair as well. So in a high availability design, I will have one PG1A for primary call manager, PG1B for secondary call manager. For the next two group of call manager, I will have PG2A primary, PG2B backup. Same thing until I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm exhausted of all the subscribers that I have in my cluster. If, uh, if you have a 2000 agent or less, then it makes sense to only create one group, a pair of PG, uh, one pair of calls, uh, subscriber, for example, although you could have multiple subscriber uh, group. But what we have here is that we have one PGA and one PGB pointing to one primary uh, call manager and one secondary call manager. Now, remember, if the phone is registered, let's say if this phone is registered to this call manager here, this PG will be able, still be able to control that by sending an inter message, inter uh, tra inter cluster trunk messaging between the published both publisher, uh, sorry, between the primary and the secondary servers on the other group. Agent phone, pretty much uh, all uh, Cisco phones 
do support uh, are supported most Cisco phones are supported for agent obviously you have uh, starting from the entry level to the high end you also have the new generation phone that has a multi-line agent support um, a multi-line agent support basically allows UCC to monitor multiple line and enabling join across line feature and direct transfer line direct transfer across line feature as well now multi-line functionality is now exposed on agent device as well so that when a call comes in you get to see that which line the call is being used either ACD line or non ACD line the reason why you need to monitor the non ACD line is that what if you know agent transfer the call to someone or conference someone in that information about that call should be part of your reporting uh, so that's one of the reasons that multi-line feature can be used. Now when a, a multi -line, multiple line being considered, system can be configured to accept or reject inbound call on any non-ACD line. Cisco IP communicator, communicator can be also used as an agent PG. Now obviously you guys are probably pr pretty much familiar with IP communicator, which is emulation of 7970 allows you to take your agent ID and, uh, and office phone extension with you wherever you go. So that's pretty much it for the design uh, aspect of this particular course. And I will see you guys in the next lab uh, chapter.